Welcome to Introduction to JavaScript for Apex Developers. This is Module 1, JavaScript Basics. In this module, I'll start off talking about why you might want to learn JavaScript, and then I'll cover the basics of the language, touching on things like variables, operators, conditionals, and functions. Finally, I'll talk about your browser's developer tools and why they're so important when working with JavaScript. Do you know who that is? That's Joel Kalman, co-creator and now director of development for Oracle Application Express. Joel said back in 2017 in a blog post that if you're looking for a great Apex developer, you're really looking for a full stack developer. I couldn't agree more, but what exactly does that mean, full stack developer? A full stack developer is one that can work across all tiers in an application's architecture. Apex uses a simplified two-tier architecture, at least in terms of where your logic goes. On the server side, it's just Oracle Database, so of course you'll want to learn some of the basics there, such as what starts and ends a transaction. You'll need to learn a little bit about data modeling, perhaps targeting third normal form, and then you can learn SQL to query and manipulate your data, and PL SQL for those times where SQL alone isn't enough. But what about the client side of things? What does that look like? Well, if you wanted to learn a new programming language today, you'd have no shortage of options to choose from. There are old languages and new languages, even languages with cute little animals for their logos. But only one of these languages is going to help you fill in the picture when it comes to client side development in a web browser, and that's JavaScript. So the client side of things ends up looking like this. As was the case with the server side before you got to SQL and PL SQL, you first had to learn a little bit about Oracle Database and data modeling. Well, before you get to JavaScript, it's best to know at least a little bit about HTML and CSS. I won't cover either of those topics in this workshop, but there are plenty of free resources available online. Keep in mind, your goal here is not to become some kind of JavaScript master because it often takes just a few lines of JavaScript code to deliver functionality not available out of the box with Apex. And that is the reason most Apex developers would want to learn JavaScript. I do want to warn you before we continue. Adding custom JavaScript code to your Apex applications does add some risk. And this is because the JavaScript code is often dependent on the underlying structure and content of the HTML that Apex generates, and that can change from one version to the next. So when you upgrade Apex, you may need to update your JavaScript code to accommodate those changes. Generally, it's not too bad, but don't say I didn't warn you. Here are some tips to avoid any issues while upgrading Apex. Number one, be conservative in your assumptions about the HTML that Apex is going to generate. If you can use your own static IDs, custom CSS classes, and HTML tags, that's always going to be safer. Number two, stick to the documented Apex APIs. There's a link here you can use to access the documentation for Apex's JavaScript APIs. And there's a saying in the Oracle world, if it's not documented, it's not supported. That's certainly true here as well, so just stick to what you find in that documentation. Number three, avoid deprecated APIs. To do that, you'll need to read through the release notes for each new version of Apex to find out what's been deprecated. That also includes, however, the third-party libraries you may be using, such as jQuery. In those same release notes, they'll let you know if they've changed the version of such libraries. And if that's the case, you'll need to check the release notes for that library to see if anything that you're using has been deprecated or outright removed. I think it can be useful when learning a new language to use a language you already know to help. I think everyone watching this will be comfortable with PL SQL, so I'll be using that language to introduce new concepts in JavaScript. PL SQL was designed to extend SQL. It's in the name, the procedural language extensions for SQL. JavaScript, on the other hand, was designed to program the web. Both languages are third generation programming languages, but PL SQL is based on Ada, and that's where it gets its block structure, the execution sections and optional declaration sections, as well as things like the difference between a function and procedure, all of that comes from Ada. JavaScript, on the other hand, borrowed from Scheme, C++, and Java, so it has a more modern syntax. 
It's also a very flexible language. You can use it procedurally like we do with PL SQL, but you can also use it functionally, object oriented, event driven. It's a very flexible language. Let's get into some of the details, starting with variables and data types. Hopefully everyone is aware of how declaring variables works in PL SQL. In the example on the right, I have two anonymous blocks, one nested within the other. What I'm doing here is referring to max salary and the way scope resolution works, PL SQL will first look to see if I've declared max salary in the current scope. If it doesn't find it there, it'll go to a parent scope and look for it there. In this case, it'll find it and assign the value of max salary to L salary. And PL SQL declaration is always done in the optional declaration section. And we're seeing that twice here, once for this constant, and then again for the variable L salary. And we know that PL SQL is a strongly typed language, meaning that when we declare a constant, we also declare a data type with it. And the same is true for our variables. And we can take for granted that the data type is not going to change during the execution of the program. For example, here I'm taking the value max salary and assigning that to salary, which is fine because they're both numbers. But on this line, if I try to assign this string to L salary, that's going to throw an exception. It's also worth noting that PL SQL is not case sensitive by default. So up here where I'm declaring max salary in uppercase, it's perfectly fine in PL SQL to refer to it down here in lowercase. PL SQL will resolve that without any issues. In JavaScript, things work a little bit differently. At a basic level, we use functions to create new scopes in JavaScript. And if you're not working inside of a function, you're in what we call the global scope. So here on line one, you see an example where I'm declaring a variable in the global scope. Below that, you see I've defined a function named outer and within outer, I've defined another function named inner. So in JavaScript, we use functions to achieve some of the same things that we saw before using blocks in PL SQL, but the logic works the same here. I'm referring to max salary. So it'll look first to see if that's defined in the current scope. And if not, it'll go to a parent scope where it will find max salary in this case, but the reverse will not work. If I'm in the parent scope trying to work with salary, which is defined in a child scope that will not work. In JavaScript, we can declare our variables anywhere we want. There are no uh, limits on that, but there is a best practice that says we should declare our variables in the top part of a function. And that's what you're seeing me do here, right? After the definition of this outer function, I do my variable declarations, and then I do the same thing for variable declarations within inner. To declare a new variable in a function, use the var keyword. So you've seen a few examples of that here. There are some new keywords you can use, let and const. Those are great because they create truly block scoped rather than function scoped variables. However, they're not well supported in IE 11. So if you have to work with that older browser, stick with var for now and don't worry about let and const. JavaScript is what's known as a weakly typed programming language. And that means that when you declare a variable, you do not associate a data type with it. In JavaScript, it's the values that have data types. This is a string and this is a number and so on. So it's perfectly fine for me to here assign max salary, a number to salary, and then follow that up by assigning a string to salary. This will not throw an exception in JavaScript. And if you're coming from a strongly typed background like PL SQL, this may worry you some, but trust me, it's not going to be a problem in your JavaScript applications. Finally, I'll point out that JavaScript is case sensitive. So where I declare max salary here using uppercase, I must use that case down here as well. Just something to note coming from a background like PL SQL. Here I have a list of the most common data types in PL SQL. Of course, we have access to all of the SQL types as well as many PL SQL only types, such as the new JSON data types. But these are the ones you're probably using in most of your applications. Here I have the most common data types you'll work with in JavaScript. Note that they're broken up into two groups, primitive types and objects. As far as primitive types go, I have undefined here and null, and there is a difference between these two in JavaScript. And you'll very commonly be working with string, number, and Boolean. As far as the objects go, we start with object. You can think of that as the parent from which all the others inherit, and that includes date, array, and function. 
Here you're seeing function as a data type, and this is something I'll revisit a little bit later. When it comes to the difference between primitive types and objects, the easiest way to think about it is what happens when you pass one of these as a parameter to a function. We know that we can pass parameters one of two ways, either by value or by reference. When you pass a parameter that's a primitive type to a function, you will always be passing that by value. On the other hand, when you pass an object as a parameter to a function, that will always be passed by reference. Also keep in mind that JavaScript does not do decimal arithmetic. So 0.1 plus 0.2 equals 0.3000004. That's basically a rounding error. And to be fair to JavaScript, this is actually the case in many other programming languages, such as Java, Python, and so on. So if you need to do decimal arithmetic for whatever reason, you'll need to include a library to get that done. In JavaScript, there are two syntaxes you can use to create new objects. The first is called the literal syntax, and the second is the constructor function syntax. In the examples on the right, I'm starting off with a string literal, and I'm assigning that to the variable my string. On the next line down, you see an example of a number literal, and after that, you see a Boolean literal. On line four, I have an example of an array literal. To create one of those, you just open with the square bracket, then you can place any values you want in the array. This is just a comma separated list of values. And as you can see, it's really just more literals, a string literal, a number literal, and so on. And you can also note that the values that go into an array in JavaScript do not need to be the same data type. This is fine in JavaScript. And we close off the array again with the square bracket. Beneath that, on lines five through eight, you see an example of an object literal. Objects are very common in JavaScript and easy to create. You just open with the curly brace and then you're putting combinations of name value pairs inside the object. So this object will have a property named prop one. And then we separate the name of the property from its value with the colon. In this case, prop one will have the value of my string, which is a string hello. And then we use a comma after each name value pair. So I can start here prop two colon and prop two will have the value pointing to 42. And when you're done, you just close off the object again with the curly brace. Line nine here is the oddball out. For whatever reason, dates do not have a literal syntax in JavaScript. So you have to use the constructor function. And you can tell that it's a constructor function because we have the new keyword in front of the function name. Also note that date starts with a capital D. Although it's not enforced, there is a convention in JavaScript that says constructor functions should start with a capital letter. So keep that in mind when you're naming your own functions. Don't start them with a capital unless you intended them to be used with the new keyword in front of them. If that doesn't make any sense, don't worry about it. Just don't start your functions with a capital letter. All right, let's move on to operators. Here I have the most common types of operators that you'll be working with. Assignment, arithmetic, comparison, and logical. When it comes to assignment operators in PLSQL, there's just one, the simple assignment operator. And we know for that we use the colon equals. In JavaScript, to do the same operation, we just use equals. But JavaScript also has a number of what are known as compound assignment operators in which we can do two things in a single pass. So for example, if you want to add a value and assign a value at the same time, you can use plus equals. Here's an example of using the assignment operator in PLSQL. Up in the declaration section, I declare a variable. It's a type of number. And then in the execution section, I use the assignment operator to assign the value one to the variable. Here's how the assignment operators work in JavaScript. So in place of colon equals, we're just using equals for simple assignment. But then of course you have these compound assignment operators available as well. When it comes to arithmetic operators, things are pretty much the same until we get down to modulus. In PLSQL, we use a function instead of an operator. Whereas in JavaScript, we have an operator and it's the percent sign. JavaScript also has operators for increment and decrement which are missing in PLSQL. Just a heads up, the plus sign is also the concatenation operator in JavaScript. And that means if either operand is a string, 
you get concatenation. It's only when both operands are numbers that you get addition. Here are some examples of using the arithmetic operators in PL SQL. And again, I'm just pointing out that we use a function call for mod, and this is how we do increment and decrement in PL SQL. And then here we have the same examples in JavaScript. And all that stands out is the operator in place of a function call and the fact that we actually have increment and decrement in JavaScript. Here's an overview of the comparison operators in both languages. In PL SQL, when we want to check for equality, we use equals. In JavaScript, that's the assignment operator, so for equals, we need to use double equals. When it comes to inequality, PL SQL gives you a choice. You can use either bang equals or less than and greater than together. In JavaScript, no choice. You just have to use bang equals. JavaScript does have a concept around strict equality or identity and strict inequality or non-identity. And for these, we use the triple equals or bang equals equals. And the way these work, when it comes to a primitive type, what we're comparing is not just the value, but also the data type. So we avoid any implicit data conversions. And when it comes to objects, what we're seeing is if both operands point to the same area in memory. Here's some examples of using the PL SQL operators. So in the top part here, I declare a variable named L number and assign it the value one. And then down here, I'm checking to see if L number is equal to one. And of course that's true. But on the next line, I'm checking to see if L number is equal to the string one. And in PL SQL, that's also true, which is fine. It's never really a problem. And here's how we can do the same in JavaScript. So again, starting with a variable with the value one, and I'm checking to see if it's equal to one, that's true. And using double equals, if I compare that to the string one, it's still true, just like PL SQL. But in JavaScript, I can use the strict equality operator, the triple equals, and this will check not only the value, but also the data type and avoid any implicit data conversions. So of course, in this case, we get false. My recommendation is to favor triple equals and bang equals equals from the beginning to avoid any implicit data conversions. Hopefully that will result in fewer bugs in your code. Generally not a problem either way, just something to be aware of. Finally here, we're seeing the logical operators and, or, and not. In PL SQL, doesn't get any easier. You just use the keywords and, or, and not. In JavaScript, we need to use double ampersands, double pipes, and bang. Here are some examples of using these logical operators in PL SQL. Of course, true and true is true, whereas true and false is false. Well, the Boolean logic doesn't change in JavaScript. It's just the operators that you need to swap out. True and true is still true, and true and false is still false. All right, let's see who's been paying attention. This is the first pop quiz. What is the value of total after running this script. I'll give you a few seconds here to hit pause. You can take as much time as you need to work through this, then just hit play when you're ready to continue. Okay, time's up. What'd you guess, A, B, or C? Let's work through it to get the correct answer. So we're starting here, declaring a few variables. Food is 10. Tax is 0.1, 10%, and then the tip is 2. So when we evaluate this expression, we need to start with parentheses first. So we'll take food at 10 times tax, 0.1, and we get 1. Then we can work left to right. We start with food, which again is 10, plus the 1 is 11. And then when we add the tip, which is 2, some of you might have guessed the correct answer to be A, 13. However, Keep in mind that the plus sign is doing double duty. If either operand is a string, then we get concatenation, and it just so happens that tip is a string, so we concatenate the 11 onto the 2.00, so the correct answer is B. All right, let's move on. Next up, conditionals and loops. We'll start first looking at conditional logic. Both languages have several different options, in PL SQL, you have case. In JavaScript, you have switch and the ternary operator. All I'm going to talk about is if, then, else, because that's all you really need when starting with JavaScript. 
Here's an example of how we use if then else in PL SQL. I'm starting in the declaration section declaring a variable named L result and then another one L random which will have a random number between 1 and 5. And then in the execution section I'm using an if then else here to check to see if the value of L random is 1 or 2 then I'll assign the string small to L result. Else if the value is 3, I'll assign medium to result. Else, I'll assign large to result. A couple of things to note here. First of all, the expression in the else if check has parentheses, whereas the first expression did not. So that tells you that the parentheses in PLSQL are optional. You'll also note that else if is combined into a single word. And also, the way we create the blocks for each condition is using the keywords then, in this case, and else if ends that block, then and else ends the second one, and else to end if ends the third block. In JavaScript, things are a little bit different. So again, I'm starting with result and a random value between 1 and 5. But here, in my if, note that the parentheses in both expressions are included, and that's because they are not optional in JavaScript. Also note that else if is two separate words. And the way that we create the blocks is not using keywords, but rather the curly braces and then the end curly brace for each one after the expression. While we're on the topic of conditional logic, I want to point out that JavaScript has the concept of truthy and falsy values. And there are six falsy values in JavaScript. False, of course, but also null, undefined, nan, or not a number, zero, and an empty string. So if we look at this check down here, where I'm saying if false, obviously that's not true, so we evaluate the next expression. Null, that's not true because it's falsy. Undefined, nan, zero, and empty string. All of these are falsy values, so none of them will be true, so we will not execute this line. And we will then proceed to the next check here in the else if, and now I'm checking to see else if, and this is just an empty array. And you may think, well, the empty array looks a lot like an empty string, so it's probably falsy, right? Well, you'd be wrong. It's not on the list of falsy values. So in this case, it's truthy, and we would execute this line here and assign true to the result. I point this out because you will occasionally see conditions which are evaluating expressions which are not exactly true or false, just keep in mind they will resolve to truthy or falsy in JavaScript. Okay, next up we're looking at loops, and just like with conditional logic, both languages have lots of different options, but again, you don't need anything but a basic for loop when starting with JavaScript. You can do really everything you need with that one loop, so let's just focus on that. Here we see an example of a for loop in PL SQL. This starts off in the declaration section declaring a data type. This is a table of number or a nested table type. And then I can declare an instance of that type and I initialize it with the values 1, 2, and 3. In the execution section, I'm using a for loop. I'm saying for x, and this is a nice convenient way to declare a variable that is scoped to this block. So I'm saying for x in 1 dot dot is 2, so 1, 2 the number of elements in the array using count, go ahead and execute this loop. So it'll loop three times in this case, and I'm printing out the value of the elements in the array using dbmsoutput.putline. Here we have the same logic in JavaScript. It's a little more tierce because I have the array literal syntax. So I'm using the array literal. I'm opening that up and adding the values 1, 2, and 3 to my array. But the for loop is very different. So the for loop has an expression, which is three parts. We have the first part here, where we are initializing a variable. In fact, here I'm declaring a variable and initializing it at the same time. And this breaks that rule I mentioned earlier about declaring variables at the top part of a function, but it's still very common to see this with loops. And the second part of the expression this is where we set the test to exit the loop. So as long as x is less than the number of elements in the array, then we'll continue the loop. 
And note that I'm using length here, whereas in PLSQL we use count. And the third part of the expression is how we increment the variable to eventually exit the loop. So I'm just using the increment operator on the variable. And then in, in the body here, which you create using the curly braces, I'm just logging out the variable of the values in the array. So we get one, two, and three. A couple things to point out. First of all, PLSQL is a one based array index language. So you'll start with one to access those values in the array. And JavaScript is a zero based array index language. So we want to start with zero in this for loop. The other thing of note is that in PLSQL, we use parentheses to access the elements within an array. Whereas in JavaScript, we use the square brackets to do the same thing. Just slight differences, but important ones. Okay, next up, we'll talk about objects and functions. Now I have objects here in double quotes because I know there's an object-oriented side of PLSQL, and that's not what I'm using. I'm using a simple record type, but we'll play it out anyway. So here I'm declaring a record type, and it has two properties, first name and last name, both of which are varchar 250s. And then I can declare an instance of that type here, L person. Now, if I want to set the values of those properties, I can use the dot syntax combined with the assignment operator. And here I'm assigning Jane to first name. And then if I want to access the values of those properties later, again, I just use the dot syntax. And in this case, I'm outputting the name to dpms output.putline. Here we have that same logic in JavaScript. And it's a little more tierce again because I have this object literal syntax I can use, it's a little bit lighter weight. So I'm creating a new object and I'm opening that up with the curly braces and closing it with curly braces. And in the middle I have two properties with name value pairs. The name and the value are separated by a colon and the pairs are separated by a comma. So just like in PLSQL, if I want to assign values to the properties, I can use the dot syntax combined with the assignment operator to assign Jane, in this case, the first name. And then later on, if I want to access the values of the properties, I again just use the dot syntax. And in this case, I'm outputting the name using console.log. I mentioned earlier that PLSQL, because it's based on ADA, has a distinction between functions and procedures. Functions always return a value, and procedures never return a value. JavaScript, on the other hand, only has functions. So if you want to do something like you might have done with a procedure in the past, you simply create a function and just don't return a value. It's really that simple. There are two ways you can go about creating functions in JavaScript. The first is using the function statement. And here you see I'm using the function statement. I put the function keyword followed by the name of the function and then parentheses for any parameters. The parameters are optional, but the parentheses are not. And then the body of the function is open and closed using the curly braces. The other way you can do it is using a function expression. And the function expression is on the right hand side of the assignment operator here. You're seeing the function keyword. This is an anonymous function expression. The function doesn't have a name, but the rest is pretty much the same. You have the parentheses with optional parameters and then the body of the function. Now, the way you can tell whether you're using a function statement or an expression is if function is the first keyword in the statement. And on the left, that is the case. However, on the right, the first keyword in the statement is var. So this is a function expression. And I point this out because you'll see both syntaxes used quite often. And for the most part at this point, at the introductory level, we'll just say that these are exactly the same. There are some nuances to each, but for now, we'll think of them as the same. Here we see an example of using functions in PLSQL. So in the declaration section of an anonymous block, I'm declaring a function named add. Add has two parameters, PA, which is a number, and PB, which is a number. And we are going to return a number. And in the execution section, I simply use the addition operator to add the two together and return out that value. And of course, we can invoke the function as we see here by putting the name of the function with parentheses after that, and then I can pass in my actual parameters here, one and two, and the result in this case would be three. 
Here's the same example in JavaScript. This time I'm declaring the function add and it has parameters a and b and then I'm returning out the result of adding a plus b. Note that with JavaScript we do not need to define the data types of our parameters nor do we need to define the type of value that the function is going to return. In some ways this can be considered good, in some ways maybe bad, but ultimately it lends a lot of flexibility to the language. Down here we're calling add. I'm invoking add very much the same as in PL SQL with parentheses passing in the parameters 1 and 2 to get a result of 3. Keep in mind if 1 was a string, by the time it got here it would be the string 1, that would be concatenation, 1 concatenated to 2 would be 12, and it would return the string 12. Again, that may sound a little worrisome, but trust me, in real life this is not such a problem. I mentioned earlier that functions are a data type in JavaScript, and the more formal way to say that is that functions are first class in JavaScript. So they're just like any other data type, numbers, strings, whatever. You can assign a function to a variable, and you saw an example of that in the previous slide with a function expression. You can also pass functions around as parameters, and you can even return functions from other functions. I don't have an example of that here. This one's a bit simpler, but let's see if we can work through it. So on line one, I'm declaring a function named myFunction1 that accepts a function and first it logs the value 1 to the console, and then it invokes the function that it was passed. Below that I have a function named myFunction2, and it has some parameters here, but they're actually not used within the body, so just ignore those. All this does is log out the value 2. On line 10, I'm invoking myFunction1, and I'm passing a reference to myFunction2 here. Note that there are no parentheses on the end, so this is not invoking my function 2, it's simply passing a reference. So what happens, my function 1 is invoked, it logs 1 to the console, that's why we see that first, and then it invokes my function 2, and that is why we see 2 then logged to the console next. You'll see why this is important in JavaScript when we get to module 3 and talk more about events. When you work with JavaScript in a browser, you'll have access to a variety of objects and functions provided by the browser. The first and maybe most important of these is the window object, and we consider this to be the global object. You can think of that maybe like the sysschema in Oracle. Another important object is the document object. This is an API we'll be looking at closer in Module 3. It's how we access the DOM. The next one is console. You can think of that sort of like DBMS output. If you want to get output from your application, simple debugging, that type of stuff, that's what console is for. Next one is JSON. If you're working with JSON and you need to either parse it or stringify it, there's a JSON object for that. And the last two here, set timeout and set interval, you can think of those somewhat like DBMS scheduler if you need to schedule some kind of work to be done either once in the future or on a regular basis. All right, next pop quiz. Which of the following will not throw an exception? As before, I'll give you a few seconds to hit pause and you can take as much time as you need to answer and then just hit play when you're ready. Okay, what'd you guess? A, B, or C? All three are really trying to do the same thing. They're trying to create an instance of an object literal. When we look at A, we see that it's using the assignment operator from PL SQL. That's not going to work. That'll return an error. In the next one, we see it's the correct assignment operator for JavaScript. It just happens to be the wrong syntax when we're working with an object literal. Finally, option C, we see that the name value pairs for properties are separated by a colon. That is the correct syntax, so C is the one that will not throw an exception. Okay, lastly, let's talk about developer tools. When you're coding something in PL SQL, chances are you're using a tool to help you do that more efficiently. It might be SQL Developer, perhaps it's PL SQL Developer, or even Toad. Chances are, though, you're using a tool. Well, tools are equally as important when working with JavaScript in a browser. 
Personally, I think that the developer tools that are built into the Chrome web browser are the best, but not every organization will be allowed to use Chrome, but it doesn't really matter. At the level at which we're working in this workshop, whatever browser you have will have developer tools that are sufficiently good for what we need to do. Let me give you a brief demo of some of the more important parts of the developer tools in Chrome. Here I am looking at apex.oracle.com. One of the more common ways to open your browser's developer tools is to simply right click on an element in the screen and select inspect. When you do that, the developer tools will open and default on the elements tab and the element that you right clicked to inspect will be highlighted or locked in below. You can then begin to navigate the DOM tree, which we'll talk more about in module three. But when you stay locked in on an element on the right hand side, then you'll see the style properties associated with that element and you can change them on the fly. So if I come in here and I say, maybe you want to change the color to red, no problem. We can change that. It's not a permanent change, but this is a nice way to get an idea of what would happen if we were to make such a change in a CSS style rule. So this is one tab you need to learn about and start to become familiar with using the elements tab. Again, mostly used to uh, look at the structure of the HTML content and affect some properties. Another way you can do this is by selecting this option here and then you can hover over the content above and then click what you want to lock in on. Moving over now to another tab I want to show you. This is the console tab. And the way you can think about the console tab is almost like it's a JavaScript playground of sorts. And when you type JavaScript in here, like let's say I do a console.log and then I pass in hello world. You knew it was coming. So when I execute this line, we see the result here in the console, which makes sense because we're in the console tab. I can also do things like declare a variable. So if I say var test equals value and I execute that, well, the question is where did it go? And if you remember before, I said that if you're working with JavaScript and you're not in a function, you're in the global scope. And I said at the very end of that presentation, that window is the global object. So even though I use the var keyword here, which would normally keep a variable inside of a function, I'm already in the global scope, so basically I can say window.test and then we get our value here. But because window is the global scope, I can also just say test and it will use scope resolution to eventually find that anyway. First checking, well, I'm in the global scope, so that's where it's going to find it. All right, let me clear this out. I'll clear the console and I just want to show you one other thing. So you'll be doing this in the workshop, by the way, but if I type function, and then to separate this out, I want my function to be on maybe multiple lines. To do that here, I need to hold shift and hit enter a couple times to get extra lines. It's a little bit of a pain, but that's just the way that that works here. I can give this a function name like test and use a console log in here to console log one. Now, if I hit enter, I've not executed the function, I've simply defined the function in the global scope, right? Remember that what that is, I can then say window.test. When I invoke that, I get one. Of course, I could just do test. That would work just the same. All right. I mentioned before that you'll use the console in the first module. So if you point your browser to bit.ly slash JS for Apex, You'll redirect to the hands-on labs for this workshop. And what you need to do is select module one on the right-hand side, and then you can start working through the labs for this module. If you want, you can just expand them all. So what you'll be doing in the first part is simply begin to get comfortable working with your browser's console. You'll practice opening it, you'll practice moving it around, and then executing some simple code within it. Again, the console is terribly important when working with JavaScript. So take your time as you go through this. There's no rush. In part two, you'll start working with variables, data types, and operators. And there's a few exercises for you to go through there. And then in part three, you're building up now to conditionals and loops. 
And finally, in part four, you'll take a look at objects and functions. All right, go ahead and start working through the lab for module one. And when you've finished, return to the presentations and start on module two. I'll see you on the other side.